All right, hey guys, Rick Bigger again. We're gonna go through some more EMS training videos. Uh, this video we're gonna talk about today is about field termination of cardiac arrest. Um, it's a little bit about when not to work somebody and then also about when you can terminate. This has been a uh, problem that we've had with people understanding this protocol well. So you've had some people that have, um, that have made, some, made some decisions on terminating people that maybe shouldn't have been in the field uh, where they had some questions about it. More than anything, it's just we've had a lot of uncertainty about what we can and can't terminate. So we're going to go through it, hopefully break this down in layman's terms and really easy for you, kind of make this uh, where everybody understands this, and it, it, sh it should be really black and white. When we get done with this video, if you have a scenario uh, in your mind that you think can beat this, uh, feel free to send it to me, and we'll run it through this and make sure there should be no holes in this whatsoever. We should know when we're terminating the field or when we're choosing not to work somebody that we're doing the right thing. It has to be black and white. There shouldn't be a lot of gray area to this. So uh, I've done this in the past. I've had people send me some stuff, and it's very easy to, uh, to show them exactly where it is and, and what they should do. So with field termination, let's, going to start, let's start with who you shouldn't work when you get there. Okay? The first thing in the protocol is obvious death. Okay? The thing listed... As obvious death for us is they have obviously they have no pulse and no respirations um, so that's going to be the same thing on every single one of these uh, that you do obviously that's how we determine that they're in cardiac arrest so they have no pulse and no respirations and they have to have their pupils have to be fixed okay so we have no pulse no respirations or pupils are fixed that patient's in cardiac arrest and due to their pupils being uh, fixed they've been in cardiac arrest for a while Okay. So then we move to the last four. So we need these two things always, this in obvious death, and one of these four. Okay, so very simple. They have no pulse, no respirations, pupils fixed, and they have rigor, which is probably the most common. They can also have decapitation, decomposition, or dependent lividity. I would say rigor and dependent lividity are the two most common that we run into when someone has been uh, dead for a while. Okay. The one on this that can be confusing to people is decapitation. So we can use decapitation for obvious death. We can also use that the patient is essentially decapitated. Okay? So if their head is still attached to their body, but their brain is no longer in their skull, that patient is decapitated. Okay? So if, uh, without getting into gory details, we can all kind of understand that. If, uh, if the patient is decapitated and we can articulate that the, uh, the mechanism has caused this person's brain to leave their body or on a suicide where it's obvious that the patient has no brain left, um, those patients are decapitated. That their actual head can still be attached to their body. We've had this come up. Um, this is one thing that can be used. A lot of this is about articulating in your documentation and describing the things. So on documentation for obvious death, you see this misdocumented a lot. The thing to remember when you're documenting is that they gave you a protocol for a reason. They listed reasons that you can call the person as having signs of obvious death and not work them. So there's no reason to come up with other terms for why you chose not to work them. Use the terms that they gave you. Oh, well, that being said, documenting obvious death should be very easy. I walked into the apartment complex. I found the patient laying on the ground. I immediately checked and found no pulse, no respirations, and their pupils were fixed. Upon further assessment, I found the patient had rigor. Due to these signs of obvious death, um, no resuscitation efforts were started. And perfect, that is literally perfect documentation. It listed exactly what the protocol said. There's absolutely no way that they can come against that. That is perfect. Okay. What you will see a lot is people making up their own terms or coming up with reasons why they didn't work them that aren't listed in the protocol. Such as, we came into the house, I found the patient with no pulse, no respirations, and they were cold to the touch. Okay? Cold to the touch is not listed as a reason for obvious death, so it can't be used. Right? So while that may be an assessment tool that you use, it should not be something that you count on for documentation. If you call somebody in the field 
and you don't list the things that are on this board, okay? It doesn't say they had no pulse, no respirations, fixed pupils, and one of those four things you documented incorrectly and technically you broke protocol. Okay? So if you had a case where something was to go to court or if the uh, medical director was not to agree with you on what you did, the key to making sure that we don't miss something and we don't work somebody we should and the key to keeping yourself covered uh, documentation wise is to stick to what the protocol says. Okay? Do not make up terms, just use what the protocol gave you. Uh, the next uh, thing we have is trauma. Okay, so traumatic arrests are different. They're listed different than um, the list of different than medical arrests. Okay, so a traumatic arrest, um, they have it. They have the PEA in there, which is different than the others. Right. So going over that same thing, exactly like the obvious death before, we're always in cardiac arrest. Going to have no pulse and no respirations. If we have either of those two, then we if we either have a pulse or respirations at any time, we have to work that person. But no pulse, no respirations, and they're either asystolic or they have PEA less than 40. That's the one that's different in trauma. Okay? We come onto a, a unwitnessed medical arrest. We don't have obvious signs of death, and we have an asystolic rhythm, or we have PEA that's above 40. We can call that person. Okay? Trauma is different. It has this term right here, PEA that's less than 40. So what that means in trauma this is something that can get people in a jam what that means in trauma is if you don't have one of these and you want to call that person but you don't have the signs of obvious death you have to put four leads onto that patient and verify that they're in one of these two rhythms okay so good practice for every arrest is to put pads or four lead on that patient and verify that they're in one of these two rhythms if you do that it's very hard to ever get to a jam Obviously, there's going to be times, such as if a patient's in a car wreck and they're obviously decapitated, right? Um, there's no reason to put pads on that person because you're listing one of these. But if you don't have an obvious sign, always put pads on that patient, verify what rhythm they're in. Okay. So this is for not starting arrest, everything here. This is for not starting resuscitation to begin with. Last on that before we move on to terminating once you start it. The thing that the protocol says is it says you should not start CPR if these things exist. Okay? It also says you should not continue if someone else has. Okay, so the protocol lists very specifically, it doesn't say we should consider, it says we should not. Okay? The chances of survival for these people is less than 1% of 1%. Okay? So the protocol list in there exactly says not only should you not start CPR, but if somebody already has, you should discontinue it. So it's very black and white about what they want done. Once we've started ourselves and we have started CPR and we started working this patient and we get into terminating somebody on scene, okay? Very simple, there's a little acronym for this that's out there as well, uh, do not go. But break, we can break this down very easy to exactly what has to happen, okay? So we have had this, run into this several times where people are unsure about what has to go on. It's, it's really pretty simple, okay? But starting out, we're just going to go right down the line how the protocol reads. The first thing is that any patient that's terminated, it has to be in a private residence. Okay, so private residence can include their home. It can also include uh, a nursing home. If a person is living there in a permanent basis, that is their residence. So a nursing home can be included in that. Next is that all ALS efforts have to have happened, and they have to have happened for 20 minutes. So sometimes there's contention about when this clock starts, okay? Um, technically by the book, the protocol says that until all things are in place, the 20 minute clock doesn't start, okay? So all ALS efforts means they have to have a monitor, they have to be on it, they have to have CPR, obviously, they have to have an advanced airway, uh, Kings and IGLs do qualify as an advanced airway, and then they have to have an IVIO, and they have to have medications given. Okay, so there has been arguments about whether or not we have to wait until all those things are in place. Um, it is my opinion the best thing to do is wait till everything's in place. So once you have established your airway, you have given your first dose of medication, that's when your clock should start. There should not be a rush to get to this 20 minute mark. At 10 minutes in, we should not be considering termination. 
uh, my the way that, that has worked well for me has kept me out of trouble and uh, has also got me some some uh, Ross back late in a rest is until I see the 20 minute mark as far as the time that we've had once I check the first rhythm and that monitor starts uh, collecting it until I see 20 minutes I don't even start thinking about this just work for 20 minutes straight do everything that you can do and at the 20 minute mark we can start working through everything to make sure we have all our criteria and we can talk to the family and that will get you well beyond your 20 minutes but if you start talking to the family at 12 or 13 minutes in you're not going to make your 20 minute timeline next is not shockable rhythm so at any time we cannot have a shockable rhythm okay so if we got there and the patient had a pulse right or excuse me we got there and the patient was in a shockable rhythm and we shocked them that patient has to be transported anytime that you have a shock or rhythm of any kind, whether we shock it or not. So if they change from a Sicily PEA into VFib, even if we missed it and didn't get to shock it, if you saw it and there was a switch, they have to be transported. Uh, next on the list there is in title that is less than 20, okay, at the time of termination. So this is a commonly asked question. Does it, is it at any time? Is it when we terminate? Does it have to be below when we call? Uh, the, what, what matters with your end title is that when we call the hospital and we give report to the doc that's going to make the decision on termination, that end title has to be less than 20. Okay? So if it's at 22 and we make the call and we tell the doc, hey, it's at 22 and the doc says, it's okay, go ahead and terminate, that is still on you. Per your protocol, you cannot make the call to the doc until it is less than 20 and all these things are met. So even though the doctor made the decision that you should terminate, you are still in the wrong, okay? Because that phone call never should have happened to begin with. So as I said with the 20 minutes, make sure we hit this 20 minutes. The next thing we look at is we have a cap no below 20. If, if these two things exist, we look through our criteria and make we're good and make sure that we're good. If we don't have these two things, there's no reason to even be talking about it. Just keep working or transport. Uh, last on the list of the protocol is no hypothermia and no drugs. Okay, these are very uncommon things. Uh, this last one's missed sometimes, but no hypothermia. We don't really deal with that too much here. But for an example, uh, let's say that a patient in that last ice storm this year, uh, we actually had a call with a patient that was outside. If that patient had been outside and been in cardiac arrest, you can't terminate that person uh, even if... Uh, Let's say they're at the nursing home and they're right at the doorstep and we determine it's a private residence. Um, but the patient can't be thought to have hypothermia. Or say someone's heat went out and they were arrested in their house and we think that they, maybe they were, they were hypothermic. You have to transport that patient. They have to be, what they say, warm and dead. You cannot leave a patient that's, that's hypothermic. Last is no drug suspected. Okay, so uh, anything that's suspected, as in even an opiate overdose, if that's suspected, if there's drug paraphernalia around, um, if you have somebody, a young person that has uh, overdose and, and uh, you can't call that person on scene. Okay? The, the thinking there is that the hospital can give them more Narcan than we have and they may be able to change something. It also goes with uh, hazmat scenes, um, any type of suspected toxins that are out there. Uh, pretty rare, obviously, but if you have anything like that, if you suspect that drugs cause it, you're not allowed to terminate that person in the field. One thing that is not addressed in a line-by-line -line format, or two things that are not addressed in a line-by-line -line format in the protocol, which jams people up, okay, is these two right here that I wrote in at the end. Okay? The arrest cannot be witnessed, right? So if somebody calls me and said, I saw uh, my husband collapse five minutes ago, you can never terminate that person. It doesn't matter what anything else happens. If somebody saw this person, Go into cardiac arrest, whether it is you or another person who reports it as such, you cannot terminate that person in the field. That is a witness to rest. These are the ones that we're going to get Rosk on. These are the ones that we're going to work and work and work, and we're always going to transport. Same thing with trauma. You cannot terminate trauma once you've started working it. Okay, so any traumatic arrest, once you start, you own it and you're going to transport. No matter what, no matter what you find. Okay, if you start working and you get halfway in and you determine, I think this person uh, has a sign of obvious death. You need to transport that person. You started working them for a reason and you need to work that and transport that person to the hospital. Okay. The uh, very easy stuff here, straightforward, uh, that's out there. If you have any questions about that, make sure you get with me and we get this figured out. This is uh, very easy to, to implement. It's very easy to use. 
Um, one thing we didn't talk about at all here, that's probably one of the most important things with this, is when you make this uh, determination not to transport, you're not transporting the person because there is a kind of consensus that for most people, they would rather the patient be terminated at home, not go through excess medical bills, not go through this false sense of security that something's gonna change. So that's why we do all these things. We're gonna work this person until we believe that there's nothing that could change if this person was transported. And then we're gonna let the family know. So we check off all these things. We, we're sure that this person meets all the criteria. We're gonna go have a conversation with the family and we're gonna let them know that we've done everything we can possibly do, that we're gonna contact the hospital and verify with the doctor that he agrees, he or she agrees. You're then gonna contact the hospital that you would have transported to. Generally, that's gonna be the closest hospital. Okay? We're gonna contact that hospital and we're gonna let them know, we're gonna give them a full report and let them know this is uh, Wasso Fire Medic One. We're on scene with a cardiac arrest and I need to talk to a physician about field termination. Get the physician on the line. I like to do this over the phone because it's easier to talk over the phone. Um, I'm gonna let them know uh, I came on scene and give them a full report. We have a, a patient, we found them in arrest. We have been working them for uh, 20 minutes. These are the, the rhythms that we have. These are the drugs we've given. We have like, everything has been done. We have the IO, they're innovative. We're gonna walk them through exactly like if we brought them into the hospital. And then we're gonna let them know by our protocol, uh, I feel that we've done everything and I'd like, I would like uh, to terminate the patient in the field. The doctor is then gonna make that decision. Okay, so if the doctor says no, that patient gets transported. Okay? Generally speaking, the doctor's gonna say yes, they're gonna agree. You're gonna ask for that physician's name and make sure that you document that. Once that has happened, you're gonna go back to the family and let them know what has happened. The doctor has agreed with you. You're gonna terminate in the field. Um, once they understand that, you're gonna to go to your crew and tell them to stop. Stop all efforts, stop CPR, contact di dispatch on your radio and get a signal 30 times and record that time, okay? Um, nice, easy, this is a very easy procedure. It should be black and white. Hopefully this helped you out with understanding um, what all is required to terminate in the field and what we should not be working. Uh, what is uh, signs of obvious death and traumatic arrest that we should not start. Well, thanks for watching, guys. I appreciate it, and I'll talk to you later.